So static zero hazards are not very different from static one hazards. Uh, they have the same kind of underlying structure. They have a very similar reason for existing and they have a very similar approach towards solving them. So the uh, basic underlying structure of a static one hazard was an OR gate at which two, ind two independent paths for the same um, variable met with variable delay and with uh, complement and true form. For static zero hazard, the meeting has to happen at an AND gate. Uh, there has to be a true and a complement form of the variable, and there has to be differential delay. So the only difference is that we meet at an AND gate instead of an OR gate, which makes sense because the output of an AND gate to which the true and complement form of variable are provided is obviously always going to be zero. But because of the differential delay, we can see here that when we have a transition from zero to one of the variable A, the uh, complement A bar is going to make a transition from one to zero. There's going to be an, uh, an interval of time with a duration of di, which is the delay of the inverter, during which both A and A bar have a value of one, allowing them to pass through the AND gate, provided that di is long enough to uh, overcome the uh, inertial delay of the gate. It allows them to pass through it, producing a glitch uh, at the logic one value for a duration of di. Now, it's important to notice again that uh, static zero hazards like static one hazards are always reducible to this form, but this doesn't mean that you will always have a, an explicit uh, structure such as this one. Uh, in fact, most static zero hazards uh, occur in circuits where it's a little bit more challenging to see them occurring. Now, you can see that the variable A is, is taking two paths, the top path and the bottom path. Uh, they are gonna meet at the end gate, the final end gate that produces the output F. Uh, the variable A appears in its complement form on the top branch and its true form at the bottom branch. And also there appears to be differential delay between the bottom and the top uh, branches equal to the uh, delay of one NAND gate. Uh, so these are the three conditions that allow us to observe a glitch at the output F. First condition is two path for the same variable. The variable appears in uh, uh, true and complement form, and there's differential delay between the two paths. So we can see this happening here. Also notice that uh, the variable A in the uh, first waveform made, made two transitions, one from one to zero and the other from zero to one. The glitch only appears when it makes a transition from one to zero. So when we say that a certain variable, variable is responsible for triggering the hazard, uh, that will be the result of a transition in only one direction. Because when A makes a transition down to zero, the fact that it itself is equal to zero immediately after the transition will mask any glitches from appearing. Because remember, we meet an, at an end gate in the end. Now, there are uh, other input variables to this uh, rather large uh, logic circuit. Um, these inputs have to have certain values so that the variable A can propagate to the final AND gate. Again, as with the discussion of the static one hazard, if you have an OR gate or an, an OR gate, you have to have an input of zero that allows A to be uh, passed uh, to the output. If you have an AND gate or an AND gate, you have to have an input of one. Because if you have an input of zero to an AND gate or an input of one to an OR gate, then that input will mask any transition in the culprit variable. So let's take an example of a circuit which suffers from a static zero hazard. Um, this is that exact same circuit. Um, this is uh, a product of sums circuit. The variable which will cause the uh, static hazard is obviously variable B. This, the reason I say that it's obvious that it's B that will cause the hazard is because B is the only variable that has multiple paths through the circuit. A and C have only a single path through the circuit. 
Also, b is the only variable that appears in true and complement form, so it's the only variable that even has the chance to uh, produce a glitch. Now, because the complement path for b uh, passes through an additional inverter, there's also a differential delay between the top and the bottom path for b, and so you see um, you have a b, a plus b at the bot uh, uh, for the top branch, and you have c plus b bar for the bottom branch, and the output is a plus b into c plus b bar, which allows us to observe a glitch if b makes a transition because you have both uh, the true and the complement form. Now, for product of sums uh, uh, circuits and when you suspect that there is a static zero hazard, it's better to represent the circuit uh, on the Cardinal map using zeros rather than ones. So we're going to represent the circuit using its max terms rather than its min terms. The active max terms for uh, the expression a plus b into c plus b bar are 0, 1, 2, and 6. And recall that uh, you're looking for um, squares where the function is actually 0 rather than 1. So the top rectangle represents the term a plus b, and the rectangle at the uh, extreme right of the Carnot map represents uh, the term b bar plus c. Again, notice that even though this rectangle, for example, uh, lies in the domain of b and c bar, the term that represents it, the product term that represents, the sum term that represents it is b bar plus c, which is the opposite of the sense of the domains in which it lies, because we are representing max terms rather than min terms. Now, um, these two rectangles are enough to represent the function uh, fully. We have a, a three variable uh, kernel map and um, each rectangle uh, encircles two max terms or two squares, which means that each sum term in the expression will have two variables, which is true. You can see it uh, here. And this circuit is actually the exact representation of the two uh, rectangles shown on the Carnot map. So the Carnot map is basically showing us the circuit on the top as it is. Now we have to uh, we want to see where the um, where the glitch occurs, which transition causes the glitch to occur. So when we looked at static one hazards, we said that we should look for two adjacent uh, one squares or mean term squares, which are not covered by a group. Now, we don't see any adjacent, at first glance, we don't see any adjacent squares that contain zeros that are not covered by a group, just because max term two and six, which are adjacent, are covered by a group, so are max terms zero and one. On the other hand, remember that Carnot maps are, um, they uh, have adjacency on the edges, meaning that 4 and 6 are adjacent, uh, squares 0 and 2 are adjacent, squares 1 and uh, 5 are adjacent, and so on. And so square 2 and 0 in specific are adjacent. And any transition between square 2 and 0 is going to cause a potential glitch. Now, square 0 represents the bracket term or the sum term a plus b plus c. Square 2 represents the sum term a plus b bar plus c. If you look at these two squares and you see the transition between them, the only thing that makes the transition is actually b. The only difference is in b. a and c both have the same, uh, the same value. So if a glitch is going to occur when we make a transition between these two squares, then that has to be caused by B making a transition, which is something we have already concluded by just looking at the circuit and seeing that only B has two paths that lead to the same end gate with, uh, with true and complement forms. And so we now know that the transition that will cause, potentially cause a, uh, a glitch is this transition from a, B, a plus B plus C to A plus B bar plus C. Specifically, it's the transition where we uh, move between 0, 0, 0, and 0, uh, 1, 0. So basically, we have to have values of 0 at A and C for 
the glitch to appear at the output. Why? Because A and C are both inputs to OR gates in the circuit. So if either A or C is equal to 1, it's going to mask the value of either B or B bar, which will not allow B and B bar to meet at the AND gate, causing the potential glitch. So both A and C have to be 0. Now, if B makes a transition, we could possibly have a glitch in that case. Why? Because the product of these two brackets, A plus B plus C, and A plus B bar plus C, has to be 0 when we make the transition from 0, 0, 0 to 0, 1, 0. For the term 0, 0, 0, this first bracket is 0. For the term 0, 1, 0, this second bracket is 0. So whether the input is 0, 0, 0 or 0, 1, 0, the product is expected to be 0. However, because there is a differential delay between B and B bar, there will be an interval of time in the middle where B and B bar are both equal to 1. When that happens, we will end up multiplying 1 by 1, and the product, the AND gate, will produce a glitch of duration uh, of, inver of the duration of the delay of the inverter because of the differential delay between B and B bar. We cannot rely on A and C to suppress either of these brackets because A and C are both equal to zero. We are relying on B and B bar to either of them, if either of them suppresses either of the brackets, we can guarantee that the output of the function is going to be zero, which is what you would expect if you didn't have differential delay between the two branches. So how do we solve this problem? We solve this problem by covering this uncovered transition with a redundant term, just as we did with a static one hazard. So we add a new product term. This product term is going to be a bracket C plus A, and we add it to the circuit. In terms of hardware, this is going to add this additional OR gate, A plus C, and this is not going to change the functionality of the circuit in any way, because we are adding a redundant term. So if you do just a little bit of algebra, you will find that this term is uh, going to simplify out and it's going to be redundant and it has no uh, role to play in the functionality of the circuit. However, this additional bracket is important in addressing the glitch because the output of the circuit was originally A plus B into B bar plus C. Now, these two brackets have to produce an output of 0 for both squares 0, 0, 0 and 0, 1, 0. They fail to do so because B and B bar, which we rely on to either be 0, will produce, will both be of a value of 1 for a short period of time because of the delay of the inverter. We cannot rely on either A or C to do this to nullify the, the, the function because they exist in a bracket with, uh, a, with B and B bar. Specifically, when we move between the uh, mean terms 0, 0, 0 and 0, 1, 0, in the first bracket, in the first input, we, are, we have 0 plus 0. In the second bracket, we have uh, 1 plus 0. However, the product here produces 0. For the second, input 0, 1, 0, we will have 0 plus 1 and 0 plus 0, which will also produce a 0 because of the second bracket. However, during the transition, there will be a period of time during which both B and B bar will be equal to 0, it will be equal to 1, ex uh, excuse me. So there will be a period of time during which the glitch happens where A is equal to 0, B is equal to 1, B bar is also equal to 1, which doesn't make sense, but it does because of delay, and C is equal to 0. Now, the product of these two brackets is equal to 1, and this is exactly when the glitch happens. It happens in the middle here. So what do we do? We add another bracket here, which is simply A plus C. What this does is that it guarantees that in this case, we have a 0 plus 0 an additional bracket 0 plus 0, which will nullify this glitch. 
Does this not change the functionality of the circuit? It doesn't, because whenever A and C are both equal to zero, the function will produce an output of zero. So it really doesn't do anything. It's redundant in terms of functionality, but it is essential in terms of covering for this glitch.